Randeep Saini from Mizuro, <coughs> and I'm here to continue the great debate. <laughs> so, uh, thank you to Mario for warming up the crowd regarding behavioral models. So, as well as many disadvantages, there are many advantages, um, as you correctly pointed out. Um, my aim today is to show you an example all the way through from the model to the model verification. Unfortunately, I can't show you the amplifier design results because of constrained IP, but I'd be happy to show anyone who has a question on my own laptop at booth number 306. Thank you. So uh, to start with, um, I will cover the topic of how we did the measurements for, high power for the high power transistor that we were asked to do. It was a 250 watt GAN device. So we look at the measurement setup con considerations. We did some initial load pull measurements and how we use that information to center the grid for our behavioral model extraction. We will then go through a very brief theory of the model because that is a presentation in itself if we have to do it. We'll talk about the nested measurement procedure and how we extract the model from it. Finally, we will just go through some slides on the verification and testing of the model and we'll be using data that we hadn't previously used in the model generation and look at how it gracefully extrapolates or interpolates where we found some challenges in that aspect as well. Um, so let's start. Uh, so this is the uh, Mizuro high power setup. Uh, this particular measurement was done with the ZVA67. Uh, we used an impedance transformer to load our DUT. The entire measurement was done in pulsed RF conditions. The DC was left in continuous mode. We did sense the drain DC because this, for this measurement, we had to optimize the, uh, the, the output side. For the gate side, we weren't sensing the uh, gate current. For this particular case, we felt that was enough. Um, we had a phase reference connected to the system as well uh, to, so that we could link the fundamental and harmonic measurements. So in consideration for the high power measurement, we used, uh, so we had to increase the attenuation so that we get, as well as maximizing the, can I hold it like this? <laughs> if you like. <laughs> so as well as maximizing the dynamic range of the, of the measurement, we had to also protect the receivers. So we were targeting a value of about minus 10 dBm maximum at this reference plane. We also used um, a multiplexer at the input side to, so this had two functions. So first of all, it was to clean up the fundamental signal, which was coming through um, the port of the VNA. As you know, VNAs have uh, amplifiers within, so they generate their own harmonic content. And if you then have a, a broadband power amplifier, it will also further uh, create a signal. So this was cleaning up that signal for us. So we were only seeing a fundamental signal through there. And we used a bias T as well so that we can cleanly inject um, you know, uh, DC through that path without it being an RF choke, let's say. Um, this multiplexer on the output side had two roles. So first, it was used to combine the fundamental load pull capability, which was done using a focus CCMT tuner, and two active load pull um, uh, setups here for the harmonic injection that we were trying to perform. This whole setup was at 450 megahertz, so loss wasn't that great a deal, although we did have to take care of it, considering where the optimum for the device was located. So if you consider the role of the impedance transformer and where my tuner is placed, we did some calculations and we found that the loss of the coupler the loss of the tuner all yielded um, such numbers of 0.7 and 0.6 dBs. I was aiming to get to 6 ohms so that I could close the power contour, so I will show you that later. And uh, we achieved a max reflection coefficient of about uh, 0.86, so that was about 3.7 ohms, so safely to the right side of, of the uh, uh, optimum power contour. <coughs> How wanted. big was the pit? I'm sorry? How big was the pit? 
It was a device, it was a 250 watt device. I mean, when you do the active, to reach the... Oh, the, the active signal at the uh, harmonics, we had 270 watt uh, power amplifiers. Uh, but the, the fundamental signal was run using passive load pool. So uh, other considerations where uh, we had to modulate the pulse signal. So we, uh, we have our own uh, pulse modulators which are connected to the sources of this VNA. So this particular model of the ZVA has four internal sources. Uh, one of them was dedicated to the fundamental drive and the two others were dedicated for second and third output harmonic load pull. The, third so the fourth source that was left here was used to uh, control our uh, phase reference. So the, uh, our phase reference also requires that you inject the signal source through it. Um, so I think I've covered these ones. So we did some initial measurements um, at the fundamental <laughs> only to try and see what is the scale of the grid we need because like Mario pointed out, it's very important to make sure you target your behavioral model in the right region so that um, you don't miss out, for example, the, the, the optimums and so on for power and efficiency. So this is the area we had targeted to do the measurements and with just fundamental load pull with no harmonic, we got to about 200 watts of power. We then did a power sweep into the optimum point for power and we also tuned the two harmonics to try and optimize the efficiency. So you can see here at 66% drain efficiency, we got to about 253 watts of output power um, with that set. We then got to the stage where we are going to do some behavioral model generation and um, we are using the Cardiff model plus. So typically, the, the whole premise of this model and some of the work I did in my PhD with Professor Tasker in the Cardiff group um, was to capture a global model that can cover an area, uh, you know, that can represent your uh, load pull area and suppress them into a set of very, uh, set of co model coefficients that you can then use within your simulator, and it should reproduce your power contours as well as your measured uh, waveforms and it should interpolate within that region and more importantly gracefully extrapolate. So the issues we've had in the past are under extrapolation we have non-convergence and so on. So we've been working towards finding a solution where even though the extrapolation may not be all that accurate but does it gracefully extrapolate so does it actually get there with no convergence issues. So our model, we're able to set the number of model coefficients and have a direct impact on how, um, on, uh, and have a direct feedback of how much accuracy we get. So for example, for three model coefficients, you can see in this curve here, uh, I'm getting to about 3% error um, for, so what this plot is showing on the right hand side is how much error from the center of this power contour to the edge can I get with one model. So if I use three model coefficients and they started here, what is the error with the same model when it reached this point and how many model coefficients do I need? So can I just go <coughs> on to infinity and get the best model? Well, we realize after six there really isn't much you need to do because after six model coefficients you're just making the maths extremely complex for no reason, you know, because they're there really is there really is this boundary here. Then we come to the way we extract the model for harmonics. So what I've presented here are three different setups. So if you consider the first case here, this is how I relate my fundamental to my second harmonic. So for every point, every model coefficient at the fundamental, I have two sets of second harmonic coefficients. So this is called a fundamental and second harmonic mixing model. Similarly, at the third, I have a fundamental and third harmonic mixing model. Finally, I have a relationship between the third and the second as well. So now I'm capturing a cross harmonic term between the second and the third. So if you ever tuned in the simulator uh, uh, position at the second and then try to optimize the position of the third, you would, get, um, you would get a feel of what the device is doing. It would not just stay static.
So we had two options for doing harmonic load pool. The first option was randomize the measurement. I, you just, so you set your fundamental passive tuner to a certain point and let the harmonic um, set random phases around the Smith chart. And using that information, you should have enough scatter so that uh, when you then put that in the model generator, you can extract it. This created a problem for us when we tried it because we were hitting regions of device instability and regions that we could not avoid by doing this random kind of measurement. So we went to option two, so set specific harmonic targets at each harmonic at the second and the third harmonic target and you optimize that so that you try and um, avoid those regions. And we found that they were mainly due to um, lower, at lower power levels. So, for example, we used this grid setup and we tried to avoid the region where the in instability occurred. At higher power levels, we then switched to this kind of targeted harmonic load pool. So, uh, finally we got to the nested measurement procedure. So, like Mario said, it is a lot of measurements and you cannot crunch the numbers just by looking at the data, you have to actually model it or extract the coefficients and go and look at it in the simulator. So to give you a feel for it, at each power level, um, we were setting a, uh, a load pull target for each second and third harmonic, that's individually, so if you look at the uh, flow chart I have here, so I started with the fundamental impedance set with the passive tune, I would then set a power level, and this was like a 30 dB power sweep, then set a second harmonic gamma target, for each of these, have a full family of third harmonic gamma target. Then you trigger your measurement, finish this loop, go to the next point in the second harmonic, and so on. So altogether, that yielded 80,000 measurements, and it took us 15 hours with a traditional VNA-based system. So not so fast, but uh, we got there in the end as well. In our software, we also have this model extraction suite, so we can pull in the measurement data that we then um, generated in, from the previous slide, and we're able to set up the coefficient matrix, um, as you see here on the window, and this is completely flexible. We also have a tool in here that if you do change the matrix and not use one of our presets, <coughs> you can automatically recompile the netlist to use in uh, Microwave Office and it will then use that for your custom model. Within the software, we do simple correlations between the data that we used for the model. So, I mean, we, we don't have a simulator within our software, but it just shows you whether the grid you've tried to use to run, to generate the model, is it good enough? And, and you get several plots like waveforms, uh, B waves, and some error plots here. So that's the same. Uh, Finally, you can export this file, and it's a, uh, a generic MDIF file. So we have a parser using the Applac simulator part of uh, Microwave Office, and we export that into the compatible file format. So then we get to the model verification part. So this data I'm showing here was not the one that we were using to generate the model. We did separate verification measurements to try and see how does the model perform against measurements uh, and sort of prepare uh, something for our, uh, for our needs. So for example, on this slide, we got to within uh, 0.2 dBs in terms of output power and within 1% uh, of efficiency. Similarly, when we ran the power sweep and we set the uh, power uh, set the uh, load pull target point to the maximum for power and we were doing uh, a power sweep into that load so you can this sort of test the interpolation capability of the of the model so this test here so now this is not data that we used for the harmonic load pull but what we did instead was take the same device and uh, generate second harmonic uh, load pull data which is overlaid with fundamental uh, output power measurements. And you can see here that <coughs> the uh, correlation is actually quite good. Um, the figures show that we're within uh, 0.2 to 0.3 dB output power. We did the same for efficiency, and again, we're within 1% of the result here. 
And finally, we tried to compare waveforms again of points that were not measured within the model space before uh, in a sort of compressed space. So these are waveforms at the package plane. Um, so in conclusion, uh, we presented a high power load pool measurement technique and used the Cardiff model plus <coughs> strategy to try and uh, extract the model from it. And with the structured set of measurements, you can therefore generate this kind of um, model. Thank you. Thank you, friend.